My name is Jeffrey Lewis, and I am the Global Cybersecurity Positioning Leader for GE Digital Cybersecurity Offerings. I'm also your moderator today, obviously. I'm very happy to have you join us for today's webinar. This is the first of a series that we are hosting where we are discussing the cybersecurity challenges and opportunities that are facing industrial companies as we start to transform into the new digital industrials. So before we begin, I want to invite you to submit questions as we go using the submit a question function in your webinar viewer. We will have some time at the end of the broadcast to answer as many of those questions as we can. Also, following the webinar, we will consolidate all of those questions and provide deeper answers as a follow-up to each of you. So with that said, let's go ahead and get started. First question that pops to mind is, what do we actually mean by the term digital industrial? So the term digital industrial is actually a GE-generated term that describes a new breed of industrial company that is embracing advanced technology and integrating with broader IT systems to help drive innovation. We're doing that by improving efficient, or helping to improve efficiency through big data analytics, expanding production to keep pace with demand, and supporting profitability with new, more innovative products. But all the while we're doing that, we need to ensure productivity, availability, and safety in a cost-controlled kind of environment. So simply put, well, these are the organizations that are actually producing the future. But as we know, with advanced technology, new threats are always going to be introduced. So we've seen a recent rise in OT-specific cyber attacks, and we recognize that the assets and systems are much more exposed to cyber threats than they ever have been. Joining me today is Tom Mueller, who is the Vice President of Product Management for our security solutions. Tom is a very well-recognized expert in the field of operational technology, and in particular, security for OT networks. So welcome, Tom. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jeffrey. Great to be part of this today. So recently, I just came back from a luncheon, actually. I was over in London for a couple of weeks in August, and one of the key takeaways when I was talking to customers, I sensed this apprehension that whenever we talked about addressing critical system security, they kind of got this sense that they just didn't know what they didn't know. So that was one of the things that it came back several times, question after question, that folks just aren't really aware, I think. So from your experience, how do you characterize the current level of security awareness in the industrial world right now? Well, it's it's really interesting. Uh, the 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 awareness I would say is is uh, bookended by people who believe that they are an island, they are disconnected, uh, and they are to use the term they use air gapped. And, and that is a uh, uh, position that people take when they think that isolation is actually a strategy to protecting themselves against cyber risk. And on the other end of the spectrum, we have people who are very aware uh, and, and very uh, diligent in always increasing their, their cyber posture uh, year over year. Uh, to to stay ahead of of the pace of change and and the emerging threats, you know the the folks that we see that are are um, sort of in the middle fall into two categories. We have people who are uh, in regulated industries and and have uh, a compliance aspect to to their mandate, and in in that sort of landscape where people are focused on compliance. Uh, they fall into two categories, those who really understand the uh, cyber risks and, and the practices that lead to uh, better posture, and then there are those who believe that they need to check the box for compliance and really don't get the underlying security uh, uh, ramifications, measures, practices. I see people coming from, from the IT side, the information technology side of, of the businesses, and I see people coming at it from the operational technology side. And, and there are strengths that come from both, uh, neither of which are solely capable of, of really addressing the, the complex issues of protecting critical infrastructure. So, um, you know, the, there are differences that exist in the IT and the OT space. What's, what's a given here, you, you mentioned the, um, uh, the digital industrial and the 
companies that are competing in the global marketplace today have a, an understanding that in order to reach the next level of productivity, they really do need to uh, become connected to be able to take advantage of big data, scalable computing, and analytics. So the, the very virtue of being connected is introducing cyber risk. And often we see people who are striving for this productivity outcome uh, at the uh, expense of security or without concern to security. So the, the landscape that we see really is, is driving towards connectivity, even for those who believe that an air gap is a strategy, they're starting to become aware that that's not a long-term uh, status that they can maintain. And, and really as they drive to this uh, increased productivity in the digital industrial they invariably have to address the issue of the cyber risk that connections to the outside world uh, present in their, their pursuit of that productivity. So in terms of, of IT versus OT, I come from an IT security background. So I joined a GE just, over, just under a year ago, and I spent almost a decade in a broad IT networking organization. And what we were faced with was this natural lag that existed between the development of consumer-facing IT innovation, so phones and cloud and big data, all of the big buzzwords. And then there was the, the lag with the security technology and the practices to protect the sensitive data that went into those, those devices and, and systems. So it was always a very reactive approach to everything. With each new attack, you had to respond quickly, resulting in forensic investigations that you ultimately lead to patching and ongoing monitoring to keep the problem from coming back. But the goal was always to react faster to the incident and then protect the information while you kind of put the fire out and dealt with the problem on the back end. So is, is there a similar lag between the the uh, adoption of new technology in the OT space and the application of new security approaches? Do people understand the difference between IT and OT? So, so I think there are, are differences that exist between the IT practice and the OT practice. I, I would say in general, as, as a very general statement, the, the awareness is quite a bit lower on the OT side of an operation than it is on the IT side as to the cyber risks. You know, for a long time, the IT organizations have been connected to the wild world of the internet, and a lot of those, those threats have been uh, discovered, tools developed, measures put in place to protect uh, inadvertent connections to the outside world that might leak information or let let uh, uh, attackers in. So, so the IT world has has had to deal with people in the IT networks inside of the trust zone, if you will, who need to be protected from attack to the outside world that they're very closely connected to. The OT world has not really been all that connected, and and has not gone through the upgrade cycles that the IT world tends to have gone through. So when we look at the, the drive to connect the OT infrastructure to other systems, we see a big difference. We see more uh, aged infrastructure on the OT side and, and systems that in many ways were never meant to be connected to anything else outside of the operational network. So the, uh, the, the age of the systems and the, the uh, missions of the systems are actually quite different and the tools and the evolution of the tools that have been developed to solve the cyber challenges in the OT space really have lagged the, the uh, prevalence of tools on the IT side. So when we start looking at the divide between the IT world and OT, so what we're seeing is, is different motivations for attackers. I know in the IT networking space, it was always about monetizing data that you could sell on the black market. But in OT, isn't the motivation different? Well, in, in, the, um, uh, in the wild world of cyber attack, I would say that often a, an external attacker doesn't necessarily even understand whether they're trying to compromise an IT system or an OT system. 
you know, from the perspective of uh, an IT attack, when we traverse an OT system and and move into, or, or pardon me, an IT system and and start discovering connections into the IT system, it is often just one big playground. So it can be difficult for for an attacker to know whether they're on the IT or the OT side of the house. So that's that's one thing that that I would say is that an attack is an attack. Where they can get is really the the consequence. Um, the the IT side of the house has had firewalls and and demilitarized zones in their connections to the outside world, and now as we see these systems getting connected to the uh, the OT world, we see people putting in uh, additional layers of defense, depths of defense to isolate the OT systems from the IT systems. The way I look at the OT system in an enterprise is it's actually the cash register of the enterprise. The production process, whether it's power generation or oil, oil refining or chemical development, those are the reasons why these companies make money. And all of the focus traditionally has been placed on uh, making sure that these systems that produce the products the world depends upon have, have been designed in a way that is, number one, safe, and number two, very efficient and productive with long-lived missions. It's not, un- not uncommon for an OT system of critical infrastructure to be expected to run 24/7, 365 for multiple years without really going through any major patching or upgrading cycles. So the types of vulnerabilities that exist can can live a very long time in those systems. So when we're talking about the history and the evolution of protection for both sides of the house, that's when we start to see the convergence of IT technologies and IT security processes kind of being integrated, I guess, into the OT space. But is that kind of what what's happening now? It seems that they're kind of meeting at a critical point now. Yeah. So as as these systems get connected, there's there's definitely a convergence that's taking place, and and uh, depending on the nature of the connection that is is occurring. Um, the the IT practice, if you will, is finding its way into uh, the connection to the OT system, and in many cases, the the uh, IT practice is bumping up against a different kind of a culture that we see on the OT side of the house. Um, we we have a number of of uh, physical systems that are really running industrial processes that have consequences that are what we would call cyber-physical consequences if they're compromised, uh, as opposed to just the the, uh, exfiltration or compromise of confidential data for for financial gain. Uh, We have seen in in the past examples of the rush for an outcome, striving to an outcome. And and one of the examples that I could reference here is is the, the smart metering heyday of of 2008 to 2011, let's say, where where there was a a lot of investment in the industry for new kinds of technology on the operational side of the house. Um, Open protocols and wireless systems were making it possible to uh, gather information in a very wide area and and reduce the costs of, of a significant part of the operation. What we saw in a m- many of those cases as, as uh, systems were rolled out in pursuit of the operation, uh, operational efficiency was that uh, security for the OT system took a back seat, became sort of secondary to the outcome. And it wasn't long after a number of these very large systems were rolled out that we saw uh, cyber compromises taking place. People were able to change the the uh, settings on the meter on their house and and not for example pay for the power that they they were actually consuming others were actually using the the uh, meter uh, the smart meter as a way to gain access 
to the information systems of the utilities. So the, the absence of that cyber uh, mindset at the time of deployment and rollout, you can either do it at the beginning or you can do it later. And if you do it at the beginning, you're likely to avoid a number of consequences that will undoubtedly come back to bite you if you don't treat that uh, uh, with the attention it needs at the beginning. All right. I have a funny story about that, too. I know I'm, I look younger than I actually am, but I worked for about seven years in the utility space just as smart meters were starting to be deployed across the grid. And what we'd find is there were a couple of things happening. One, there were folks that were trying to game the system and save as much money as they could. So they were using these large magnets that they would put on the smart meters, thinking that they could disrupt the meter enough to save on their electric bill, I suppose. I think that, to me, kind of becomes the the initiation, then, of OT types of attacks. In the IT space, it tends to be you know, sophisticated and organized now, and they've gotten very good at the the infiltration and attack vectors. In the OT space, though, is it just kind of a, a bit of dumb luck? Because as you were saying, it's a big playground. You know, it, it seems to be folks are trial and error with what they're looking for in the OT space. Well, I I, I think there are cases of where it's trial and error. Uh, people that that are, are just looking to see what they can access remotely. You know, we have a, many examples of... of um, uh, cyber attack finding its way into an operational system and having negative consequences, cyber physical consequences. But we also have the opposite uh, in, in some of the case studies. There have been cases where uh, uh, attacks have been launched against the OT side of a system and, and the OT system has been used as what we would call a reverse pivot, moving from the OT system to gain access to the IT system and uh, in effect use the OT system as a, a vector to exfiltrate confidential information. So I think those types of, of attacks and that kind of awareness is on the rise and uh, people are starting to, on, on both the IT and the OT side of the house, understand that they're in this together and that that they're both part of the same enterprise. They both have to solve the problem together and, and do so in a manner that really anticipates the intended attack as well as the uh, uh, unintended attack. And that kind of takes us right into the next question, which is, you know, what does it actually mean to secure the industrial Internet? And we've got a few things that are, seem to be com converging in the center. <laughs> Yes, def definitely. So, so from our perspective, you know, and, and, and World Tech's perspective is has been highly influenced by uh, ten years of work on the industrial infrastructure side of the problem, uh, taking a lot of the the awareness of what goes on in computer systems and IT systems, but then tailoring that insight to the the operational technologies and critical infrastructure. So, the the there are three main components that we believe are, are necessary in order to effectively secure uh, critical infrastructure or, or an industrial ecosystem. And it really starts with this industrial mindset. The industrial mindset takes into account things like uh, the missions of these systems, which are often focused around zero downtime, safety as a practice, uh, the engineering discipline and the quality focus that typically goes into designing these industrial systems and, and recognizing that, that these systems in many cases are the cash register of the business and any downtime or any physical consequence of that, that system has long-reaching, far-reaching uh, uh, ramifications. The second thing I'd, I'd say that uh, we believe is important is, is to really have what we would call cybersecurity expertise. And, and when you deal with uh, these critical infrastructure systems, the cybersecurity expertise really needs to understand the similarities between IT technology and also the differences between IT technology. So the types of technologies that are used in some layers of critical infrastructure are very similar to IT. There are workstations, there are standard software stacks, there are standard applications. 
but very quickly as you, you reach deeper into these, these OT systems, you run into a different kind of technology stack, embedded equipment, real-time operating systems, uh, industrial proprietary protocols that are used to, to connect these systems together. And, and so you need to understand the differences in the technology and the differences in the vulnerabilities that that technology may have for a very long period of time because of the long-lived missions of the industrial system. And the consequences of a compromise can mean danger to life and limb. And then I think the, the third area that, that we focus on is purpose-built technology. Uh, we believe it's important to look at the specific nature of the risk at a layer in the system and then make sure that the, the uh, protective measure that you're employing inside of that system is going to be uh, respectful of the mission of the system. And, and here we see things like the ability to deeply understand uh, the, the protocols that are used to connect these systems together, to respect the time scales on which information is transferred, and, and not to introduce any uh, unintended latency or jitter into these systems, which are often very dependent upon uh, short time cycles in order to execute. Now, hearing that, it, it's starting to make a lot more sense to me, too. And from my history in the IT space, it was always about data protection, data privacy, and making sure that things did not get stolen and put out in the world that you didn't want out in the world. So when I start learning more now about the OT side of the house, what I'm starting to understand is it's not just a difference in motivation of the attacker. It's the risk to safety, people environment, the assets themselves, those kind of things. So where we were looking in the IT space that the breach was focused on stealing information, we kind of knew who the actors were. They had a basic persona that we understood. So I guess is it fair to say then that the motivations of OT-specific attacks are really just focused on disruption or there's nothing monetized in there really that they can steal? So I think is that the big difference then? Is it the motivation of the attacker? Because I think the attack types are still the same. So a lot of the you're, you're right. A lot of the attack types are the same. I, I think that there are different kinds of actors that that we encounter. Um, it, it generally we say that there may not be uh, as much information that can be compromised, extracted, and monetized in an industrial system. But that's not always true. Uh, there there are uh, trade secrets that are often uh, loaded into these control systems that are protected very, very uh, closely by the manufacturers. So exfiltration of recipes and, and you know, production secrets are, in effect, uh, the targets of some attackers. Uh, but, but the run-of-the-mill type of cyber consequence that, that we're really trying to uh, help operators protect against is really the, the unintended consequences, either from outside or from within uh, these systems. So really the, the focus here is on making sure that the, the operational system remains running and that the critical assets are going to operate safely so that uh, any of the risk to safety of people, environment, and assets is, is really preserved, and then uh, honor the mission of the system through uptime and quality and performance of the product that's being produced. Okay, that makes a lot more sense to me then. So I know when we were talking earlier, we talked a bit about you know, the different ways that we have to think about IT versus OT. I think this section is where you really get into the meat of that conversation. Yes, yeah, so this, this slide is a bit of a, a call out on the three-legged stool of industrial mindset, purpose-built technology, and cybersecurity expertise. And it, it tries to compare and contrast the, the mindset from an IT or an OT perspective. In, in the IT systems, often the priority is, is maintaining the confidentiality of the information. And information is, is either viewed to be at rest or in motion. Uh, and, and access to the information, uh, if it's not maintained, if confidential 
confidentiality is not maintained, then it can be exfiltrated and, and used for financial gain. In the case of OT, the priority is really about availability of the system. There are many cases where uh, uh, compromises are known and they are permitted to continue because the availability of the system or, or the mere uh, uh, transition from an operational state to an unplanned shutdown state might introduce risk and danger. So availability of the system tends to be key. Uh, whereas as data is often what's at risk in, in the uh, IT systems, physical equipment and, and uh, physical consequences are what are at risk. The patching cycles often tend to be um, uh, much more rapid on the IT side of the house than they are on the OT side of the house. And, and as I said, many of these patching cycles may take years, uh, months if not years, to, to uh, put protections in place that have been long known in the IT space simply because of the operational mission of the OT technology. On, on the purpose-built technology, the, the um, main difference that we see here is that there's a, a whole host of standardized protocols on the IT side. In the OT side of the world, uh, there are a lot of pieces of equipment that have been built around proprietary technology, proprietary protocols, and, and these are uh, really what are the glue that allows those systems to connect with each other and, and allow the machine-to-machine -machine type of interactions that are required to run an industrial process. So the, the protective measures that you employ in an IT world are often based on many standardized protocols where on the OT side, you get into all kinds of esoteric and proprietary protocols that are just the glue that these systems are used are using to, uh, to communicate with each other. And then I, I mentioned this earlier on the other side slide where, where the technologies employed uh, in, in IT tend to be what we would call an IT specific stack. The, uh, Types of testing and certification are IT centric. Um, you know, we, we know that Windows or Linux variants are kind of the dominant technologies that we see on the IT side of the house. There are standardized versions of, of a handful of databases or, a, you know, a, a, a small set of enterprise applications that tend to run there. And they're deployed in the, the millions of units around the world. And, and that represents a, a target-rich environment for one kind of a compromise to be widely applied. On the industrial side, we have domain-specific certifications, domain-specific uh, environments, and very industry-specific or, or mission-specific types of technologies that are employed. And, and they're a much smaller population uh, that are widely deployed and, and don't go through nearly as much of the intense testing and, and, and vetting and, and sort of uh, refining that takes place when you're dealing in the millions of units. The first time I actually saw this slide, it actually turned the lights on for me. When I looked at OT security through the IT security lens, what we would talk about in the IT space was always data is data. You protect data with firewalls and routers and you know, devices, those kind of things. But then when we got down and really started to understand that the difference between the, the IT standardized protocols and the esoteric protocols that exist in OT, that's, I think, when the, the, the lights went on to say this is very different spaces. And I know you've got a slide here that talks about kind of the – the technologies from both sides and where some things sit and th some things don't. Yes, yeah, so so in, in many cases, the words can be the same, but the, the fitness for purpose can be different depending on where you are in this multi-layer ITOT architecture. So so this is a, a chart that we use when we're, we're working with customers who are trying to understand what protective measures they need to apply at what layer in their network. And, and you know, the top half of this, this uh, slide talks about the kinds of technologies and the objectives and tools that you would use in a traditional IT-oriented protected network. And then the bottom half kind of shows similar but different technologies that you would employ 
in the OT depth of the network. And, and I'll, I'll just call out a couple of, of uh, examples. So, for example, the, um, um, the stateful firewall often is used to uh, track what's, what's going on in terms of the communications between actors inside and outside of the network and, and effectively decides which if holes, if you will, or which, which access paths are going to be opened up and to, to see what known addresses may be accessing services inside of the system. Whereas it's not enough in an OT system just to open up a, a connection. It's important to see how somebody is using that connection and, and to be able to narrow the attack surface of a connection that has been opened by being able to reach deeply into the understanding of a protocol that may be being used. Another technology that is, is quite common in, in the uh, IT networks is this notion of, of detection, uh, sandboxing, and detonation. The, uh, the idea here is that if, if a threat is detected uh, or suspected, it can actually be put into a test environment, quarantined, and let to execute as, as it was intended and to be able to actually see whether or not there was any malicious intent in that package. Well, the reason you can sandbox is because these pieces of technology are easy to replicate. They're, they're you know, standardized technology stacks. A workstation is a workstation with a known set of capabilities. The notion of sandboxing on the OT side of the house is, is really very difficult to accomplish because the types of systems that are being used to execute a particular industrial process may be a one of a, are, are very likely a one of a kind process or a one of a kind system in the world. Um, so those are a, a few of the, the examples. Um, people talk about uh, intrusion prevention and intrusion detection systems that really do packet inspection. Well, on the OT side of the network, packets are really not all that interesting. It's a string of packets strung together into a conversation on a long-lived conversation in a protocol that are, are really of interest and, and necessary to understand the context of, of what is trying to be accomplished. So we don't focus on deploying a tool that does packet inspection in the OT network. We focus on deploying a tool that really understands the protocol and inspects the protocol and recreates the conversation and allows operators to prevent certain conversations from even happening. Another, another aspect that, that is often uh, important on the OT side relative to the IT side is the ability to retrofit these existing networks to establish a segmentation approach in these networks without having to re-engineer the entire system. OT systems are often highly engineered. They can take years to build. They, I've, I've been involved in some, some OT systems that have taken a year just to commission, multiple years to design and a year to commission and get the operation running. If you have to come back and, and talk to an operator of a complex system like that, that they're going to have to re-engineer their system and take downtime in order to segment their network, they're not going to do it. They're going to forego the protections. So you need a fit for purpose technology that will allow the protection without the disruption that is often tolerable in parts of a, a fast changing IT network. That's a very interesting point too, because if as I'm thinking while you're talking, if I'm an operator and I'm working with my specific asset at my, my control panel, and the asset stops working, I don't know enough to know that it's a cyber incident. So if the equipment stops working, I think my first reaction would be, is it plugged in? Because that's just the way I think. But then I would go through a, a checklist of things that would be more physical rather than looking at the a possible malware infection of the device that I'm using to control the big asset. So it, what do you think in terms of 
of security awareness and training and those things, how prevalent is that in the OT space, and is that something that needs to be considered now? So it, it's it's very prevalent in the OT space. Uh, many of these systems, as I've said, are are have been designed and deployed for the primary mission of operations. In a, in a time where cyber threat was relatively low, the reality of the world today is that cyber threats are increasing, connectivity is increasing. So the combination of that connectivity and increased threat landscape is multiplying the risk that these systems are subject to. The the uh, the idea here is that these these systems really were never designed for cyber attack and often the first inkling that something is wrong is literally that the process stops or an unplanned shutdown occurs and because these systems were never designed with the monitoring of the cyber intent of the system people really have no way to distinguish whether the consequence of the lights out is because there's been a process failure or an unintended consequence of a cyber attack. So it, it's it's kind of ironic in the the uh, controls world that one of the the fundamental statements that's that's attributed to I think Lord Kelvin is if you can't measure something you can't control it. Much of the world's critical infrastructure today actually has that problem from a cyber perspective. There is no measurement. There is no way in these long-lived systems, as they were deployed, to really tell the difference between why the light went out. Did the light go out or the process stop because there was a failure of equipment or because somebody's been sneaking around the network and, and making things happen in an unintended way? Yeah, and that, that's a good example too is we can kind of go into this original graphic we had of the the landscape of the IT space versus the OT space and how it it kind of it comes together so as you're looking at embracing new technology to achieve the new opportunities that are out there so increasing efficiencies and those things understanding the steps that you need to take to get there I think is a, is truly the first step. So what, in your opinion, is really the best way to get started? How do people know where to, where to start making the transformation? Well, when, when people ask me where to get started, I, I generally say not getting started is the biggest mistake you can make. So we believe that there are, are three pieces to a uh, uh, robust cyber uh, strategy. Often people want to start with deploying technology, and technology is really only one part of the solution map. Uh, people have a role to play, and process and procedure has a role to play. And I, I liken this to uh, when, I, when I started my career in industrial automation, there, there was a pretty decent safety culture, but the safety culture took a couple of very serious industrial disasters to really mature. And, and practices and procedures and training were put in place so that everybody in an organization, in an operational organization, viewed that safety was their responsibility it's very similar to the quality revolution that, that took place uh, on or about the same time. I believe we're going through a similar sort of transformation in the mindset of, of the operational uh, critical infrastructure world, which is the cyber age, where we're going to have to deploy technologies and train our people and put procedures in place so that every individual in the operation has some degree of cyber awareness that then reinforces the procedures that are in place and allows them to understand why the technologies need to be deployed and to understand the information that the technology deployed can provide them to give them insight and control. So I'm, I'm thinking in terms of security awareness on the OT side versus security awareness in the IT space. 
When an issue does erupt in the OT environment, I would think the first call would be to the IT security team to say, okay, we have a problem. Is It seems to me that there's a, a communication gap then that needs to be bridged. And does an operator really speak the language of an IT security analyst to be able to communicate the problem? Or am I oversimplifying that? Is, are they able to actually get to the point and solve the problem together, or does there need to be some level setting between the two? I, I think, uh, you know, the, the image that's kind of swirling in my head as you ask that question is I've, I've called many a help desk, and and if there's a cyber-physical consequence in flight, I don't have time to call the prototypical help desk. So there's definitely a cultural gap that needs to be bridged here. And this comes down to the, the realities of the consequences of the IT mission versus the consequences of the OT mission. I've, I've uh, met with many customers who are, are trying to figure out how to bridge that gap. And invariably, they're experimenting with some form of bringing these two worlds together not just as a consequence of the technologies coming together, but because culturally there needs to be a common language between the IT and the OT practice. There are a lot of really good practices that have been refined over the last decade on the IT side of the house, and there are some very good practices on the OT side of the house around safety and quality. And the combination of those two practices coming together, I think, is really uh, where the solution lies. I've seen customers who, who have IT taking over some form of governance on the OT side of the house, which often has an allergic reaction on the part of the OT uh, practitioners, but it does have the effect of forcing the OT practitioners into the cyber game because they, they fear that their mission of their equipment will not be honored by the types of service levels that they are, are typically experiencing on the IT side of the house. I've seen organizations who will uh, promote rotational engagements between the IT and the OT uh, practitioners so that they get this cross-fertilization among the teams so that they can bring those worlds together. So this really speaks to the, the governance and people process part of the problem that, that invariably is going to have to be solved. Then with that conversation too, then you start to get into the conversation about the actual equipment that's in use. I think we touched on this a bit. We've seen examples of folks that are running heavy equipment using a Windows XP machine. It's, a, it's an operating system that's not even supported anymore in some places. So even with the best designed device or, or the most secure software, if you install that on one of those antiquated machines that hasn't been patched for decades, aren't you just introducing vulnerabilities into the new tools that you're trying to use to improve your efficiency? Yes, definitely. The the entire stack, as we say, needs to be considered in in this uh, this equation. So so there are very real cases where operations are dependent upon technology that is outdated, end of life, and continues to operate. Those systems need to be protected in ways that go beyond just replacing the systems because they, in many cases, cannot be replaced. Uh, so that, that really speaks to providing some kind of a, a barrier or a protective layer around that equipment uh, so that it can be virtually patched by providing protective measures around that piece of equipment. Um, so I, I, I think there's no one size fits all. Um, we, we, we will, I, I, I'm not sure we will ever get out of the patching cycle uh, conundrum that we face here. The, the, the challenge really is to understand what is my cyber posture at what part of my system and what are the protective measures that we need to put in place and how long do they have to live. And if we try and, and take a, a solution from an IT 
kind of perspective and try and force fit it into a life cycle that doesn't make sense from the perspective of the mission of the OT system, we're simply asking for trouble. I can see that as a danger. Um, I know we've had a couple of questions submitted, and I do want to encourage folks on the line, if you do have a question, go ahead and submit it. We have a few minutes that we can go through and try to answer some. I do want to go back to one that we had earlier in another conversation. Um, when you're installing new devices into an OT environment, the accountability for security of that actual device, who owns that? Once I plug it into my, my OT stack and start using this new device that I've purchased, is the security of that device the responsibility of the the asset owner now, or does any responsibility rely on the developer of that device in the first place? So where along the line could the security vulnerabilities be addressed, and who ultimately ends up, up dealing with that? So this this um, really speaks to the the life cycle of how products find their way into the OT systems. And, and I think everybody along that supply chain has a responsibility. The, the most mature customers we deal with who view that their operation and their, their cyber posture is not only their responsibility, but the responsibility of their suppliers are really quite mature in the way they qualify equipment and, and ensure that equipment has been tested and certified before it can even be introduced into their operation. So there are, are standards in place or standards emerging in the international marketplace that owners of equipment can point to and require their suppliers to conform to or not be allowed on a bidding list. So we have, have consulted and worked with equipment manufacturers to help them understand how to develop secure products. Uh, we have worked to, to provide standardized tests to uh, be able to baseline the, the, the resiliency of industrial equipment under the face of cyber stress. And, and in some cases, operators are actually using some of those tests or requiring certificates from their suppliers to, to gain a measure of confidence that their supply chain that they are relying upon is, in fact, secure. Well, I think that's, a, that's an important step that folks need to be considering. Um, also, I know in the IT space, one of the, the big drivers for change is regulatory and legislative pressure, so changes in laws, changes in regulations. In the OT space, and we already operate under some pretty heavy requirements, just out of just your experience, are we seeing changes like those that may be coming into the OT space? I know the, the NERC SIP is one that pops to mind, and a few others that are just kind of percolating out there with the emphasis on securing operations and securing cyber practices. That begs the next question is, are we looking at new requirements coming from different sources now? Yeah, it's definitely the the awareness of the cyber threat is is uh, in the industrial landscape is definitely increasing. Uh, it, it's interesting that um, if you work in the industry, nobody wants to talk about it because nobody wants their their name associated with a compromise. But privately, uh, there there is a very heightened awareness about the entire supply chain and and the uh, need for all parts of of the contribution to the critical infrastructure space to be able to be more secure tomorrow than it is today. Um, there are a number of, of uh, standards in the works. Some of them are national, some of them are international, but many of them are focused on uh, the critical infrastructure that, that the world depends on for its goods and services. The uh, the interesting thing is I, I was uh, recently at a, a conference in Europe. It wasn't focused on critical infrastructure, but it, it was focused on the Internet of Things. And I was actually very surprised to find that there was a lot of, um, how would I put this, let's say uh, uh, international desire to have some of the practices that other 
regions or countries have with respect to uh, vulnerability disclosure, uh, requirements to resolve vulnerabilities, and, and to have a more open approach to accelerating the pace of change. And, and in, in some geographies, they're, they're literally asking their governments for regulation. In, in other industries the, that I've been, been involved in, those industries really would rather self-regulate and they are, in, in some respects, fearful that governments will regulate. So they're collectively, as actors in that industry, rushing to show that they can police themselves and, and uh, put standards in place in industry consortia so that they can advance the state of the, the industry without having to be formally regulated. So depending on the industry, depending on the geography, I, I see a lot of activity here. The, the good news is there's a lot of positive motion to improve the posture worldwide. But I think we've got time for one more question. We have a pretty good one that says, you know, I understood that the OT security as a, as is at first a technical problem. Is it also a commercial problem? Is the industry ready to spend money? And if so, when? I think the answer to that is um, now. <laughs> uh, so so I, I think it's very interesting. We, we've gone through a transition, I would say, in, in my estimation, in the last 18 to 24 months, where companies that we've consulted with have been sitting on the fence about whether investing in improving the cyber posture of their products that go into critical infrastructure would be an advantage or not. Would it be something that could command a higher price or better customer satisfaction or better customer confidence? And I would definitely say that within the last year and a half that the tides have turned where manufacturers believe they can't resist this any longer that the supply chain pressure of the buyers back through the supply chain if they don't if they're not if the, the suppliers are not able to demonstrate that they have taken cybersecurity seriously in their product development or their system integration practices that they're at risk of losing business so yes the time is now and and it's it's accelerating the pace of change Right. I think we all see the same kind of direction. Um, with that, thank you, Tom. This has been fantastic as always. And I, I hope that the folks on the line with us have gotten as much of it, out of it as I have. But one thing that as we wrap up, I do want to point out, there are several things that folks can be doing right now. And of course, we do offer online training and some other things. Assessments, I think, is a really good first step. You just don't know where you're starting or if you need help kind of getting in, in the right vein and, and going in the right direction an initial either site assessment or a quick health check, something that gives you an idea of what's going on, I think is a critical first step. Um, this is, as I said from the beginning, a first in a series of webinars that we are conducting. So the next one is coming up. We're going to do these on about a monthly basis. So coming up first part of November, we'll be covering a, a couple deeper dives into some things that you can do to improve the or harden the attack surface of OT security. And then the next one coming in December is one that I'm kind of excited about. It's, it's what's actually going on out there from an attack perspective on OT. So taking some of the learning that we've had of the recent attacks and the things that we're seeing in trends and discussing that in a, in a hosted webinar. So the December one will be a really interesting conversation that we're going to have. But with that, I would like to personally thank everyone for joining. Thank you, Tom. It's been a fantastic conversation. And we will Thanks, be following Jeffrey. up with everyone. Um, <laughs> thank you, sir. We will be following up with everyone that has joined us today with the questions that have been asked and deeper answers from a couple of other, other conversations as well. So be looking for an email from us to you guys with a whole bunch of attachments and some steps that you can start taking now to gain some more familiarity and be ready to take the next steps as we start transitioning. So with that, I thank everyone for joining us. We live in a very interesting world and we just need to take the right steps in the right direction.